Welcome to Phillips Mill Art Talk. I'm Laura Womack, and with me is our executive producer, Jen McHugh. Hi, all. Art museums are often academic institutions presenting art from a European American canonical perspective, but we know that art is personal. What you see in a piece of art is influenced by what you've already seen, what you've experienced in your life. And art institutions that have traditionally displayed art and authoritative analysis for our education are now asking curators from different backgrounds to design exhibits. And they're asking visitors what they think about the works on display. Rather than a lesson in art history, it's a conversation. Our own Michener Art Museum has recently mounted such a show called Reframe, Community Perspectives on the Michener's Art Collection. Curators with multiple social and environmental viewpoints have selected familiar works and have shared their personal interpretations. But what does this mean for the role of the museum as educator? And how will it affect our experience as art lovers? Here to talk about the Michener Art Museum's new Reframe exhibition is Chief Curator, Dr. Laura Igo. She specializes in American art and material culture of the 19th century. She's worked at Harvard Art Museum, Princeton University Art Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and more. She has a long and distinguished resume. Welcome back to Art Talk, Dr. Laura Igo. Thank you, Laura. It's great to be here. Also joining us is Joshua Lassard, Director of Exhibitions at the Michener. He's an award-winning designer and a registered architect. He's worked at Penn Museum in Philadelphia and is a consulting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. Another very distinguished scholar. Welcome for the first time, Joshua Lassard, to our talk. Hi, thanks. We're gonna hear from some of the guest curators via uh, pre-recorded interviews. Um, and we'd also like to hear from you in the audience. Please share your questions in the Q&A. Jen will have some links for you in the chat. So we'll find them more easily in the Q&A. Okay, let's get started. Um, Laura and Joshua, um, tell us what this exhibition is. What does it mean that you've invited guest curators and the visitors are talking back? So, I mean, I could I could start talking about, you know, what why we did this or why we were interested in launching this project. And that is because we were interested in getting new fresh perspectives on our collection. Um, I've, you know, since I've been at the Michener you know, about three years ago, I've done a lot of work with our permanent collection and done some exhibitions drawn from our permanent collection. But, you know, I'm just one voice, one perspective and, um, and somewhat limited one. And I was, I wanted to hear from other people and, and you know, new kind of generate new scholarship and new thinking about our iconic artworks. And we also were interested too in, in thinking, you know, inviting dialogue and conversation in about our collection as well. We wanted to show our visitors that there's not just one um, curatorial viewpoint on a collection, that there can be, or on an artwork, there can be many different viewpoints and ideas and understanding around a, a piece of art. Um, and we wanted our visitors to feel like their opinions and thoughts and perspectives mattered as well and, and wanted, wanted to know what people thought about how we were presenting our work, how we're interpreting our work, um, and what they would like to see, how they would like to learn about our collection. So that's um, what drove the process and why we decided um, to embark on Reframe. Um, and so we identified uh, some curators um, to work with. Um, we ended up working with eight guest curators total. Um, to mine our collection, choose some artworks, and, and think about, you know, especially themes of identity and environment. Um, these are themes that we thought resonated really strongly across our collection. Of course, we're known for our Pennsylvania Impressionist landscape paintings, for example, you know, which of course have to deal with the environment, but also I think can be um, thought about in terms of identity um, and, and in that respect. Um, and so I know you have a few clips from the guest curators today, Laura, but we, we worked with, um, Joe Baker, who is uh, an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Oklahoma, um, and he um, is a co-director and founder of the Lenape Center in New York. Um, he worked with Reg Hoyt, uh, who teaches at Del Val Delaware Valley University, teaches um, biology, um, and also is interested in um, climate change and the environment. Um, T.K. Smith, who is um, a cultural historian, a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware, who's interested in landscape and identity and historical erasure. 
um, and also members of Doylestown Rainbow, Doylestown's Rainbow Room, um, the local LGBTQIA plus youth group um, not, you know, that meets not so far from the museum. So, um, well, thanks for that introduction, Laura. Mm -hmm. Joshua, what does that end up looking like when you go into the museum? Right. So I think um, one of the things that Laura touched on very briefly is that um, this is also inviting new participa uh, participation from visitors and also a way of engaging different audiences than maybe we're used to seeing um, on the museum floor. So we have our dedicated uh, in the museum, the Beans Gallery is where the sort of eight curatorial voices that Laura mentioned, um, their work is sort of on display. And then scattered throughout the museum, we have these sort of feedback stations, these uh, frames, if you will, these reframes um, that invite uh, visitors to vote. So we either have um, or, or provide other types of feedback. So in terms of direct engagement or participatory design, we might have two labels on the wall, for example, that explore different themes in different ways. We're asking the visitor to read each of them and then to use a voting slip to sort of say, you know, I prefer this label or I prefer this one. Um, we might have an example where um, for the Garber mural, we have a visual didactic. You know, it's one thing where we're very aware that the mural is 30 something feet wide. So of course, when you're reading the label, you can't see the whole thing. So we wanted to explore how helpful is it to the visitor to have a photograph there with the work? And so I'm trying to get those forms of engagement and feedback. And then we'll also have um, sort of open format uh, feedback spaces. So there's sort of these voting cards that you can use where we ask you to fill in a form and say, I think that there's like five different categories of information. We're asking you to rank uh, which one you think is most important and then submit that. So it's many different types of feedback stations throughout the museum. And then also sort of in our Beans Gallery, this core of, of new voices. Great. So Jen, can we take a look at, um, uh, Laura Igo has put together a couple of, has put together a slideshow for us. We'll take a look at those and we'll intersperse that with some of the voices of the guest curators that um, I recorded in interviews before we're all meeting tonight. So we'll hear from them that way. Tonight, we're primarily looking at the role of the institution, but I think it's important to take a look at what this means in terms of this exhibit. So Laura, I'm gonna pass over to you since this is your uh, presentation, your slideshow. Oh, sure. I mean, I didn't I didn't intend it to be a pre presentation necessarily, just images that I mean, happy that we could talk about or draw from. So I don't, I don't have a presentation prepared, but you know, if you wanted to scroll through, Jen, I could kind of give visitors an overview of the, of the exhibition, which as Josh says, ex extends throughout all of our galleries pretty much. Um, so this is walking into the Beans Gallery, which is where our guest curators have, um, have, have, we have their, the artworks that they selected and their label text on display as well. Okay, we'll we can take keep going. Yeah, we can keep going too, Jen, if you want. Um, this is Reg Hoyt's section, um, and he uh, specifically looked at artwork um, and thinking about um, their relationship to environmental change and specifically climate change. For example, you know, you have the great Redfield in the middle of, um, co you know, covered in snow. I think we, we think of Pennsylvania Precious paintings, we think of these really iconic snow scenes. Um, and Reg, uh, Reg writes about um, how, you know, we don't see snow like that anymore. Like that's kind of a, you know, one of the many casualties of climate change. We don't have as many, you know, frequent snowstorms in the winter as perhaps we used to, although we still, of course, get these kind of super snowstorms occasionally. And, uh, yeah. Laura, let, let's, um, mm -hmm. if you would help set us up. We do have um, a quote from Reg Smith. I'm hoping that that's yep. my fold. Um, tell us a little bit about him while I get that video up, if you would. Sure. So like I said, he teaches at Delaware Valley um, University, and he's had, also had some experience too working at museums and zoos, so thinking about collections and science um, specifically. And he also runs a program called One Health that he might be talking about in your um, clip, but that that program is is kind of investigates the, the impacts of climate change um, across different fields. It's kind of an interdisciplinary look at our changing environment. Um, and I was we were especially interested in working with him because we wanted like more of a scientific 
uh, approach to our collection. I mean, I think we usually think of art in the humanities, but you can also think of art through a scientific lens. You know what? Um, you know what is what is being represented and what is not being represented in an, in an artwork too. And and he's he's done a lot of research, especially on um, on um, chestnut chestnut trees and what I'm why am I blanking? The Allegheny, Allegheny wood rat. rat. The Allegheny wood rat, which is a a uh, species that um, is pretty much has been almost wiped out from the area. Um, he thinks because of, of its reliance on chestnut trees, um, which of course because of disease aren't you know have also been devastated regionally. So um, there is, for example, we have a, a print of a chestnut tree that he writes about. You know, <laughs> the environmental history of chestnut trees, for example, and mentions the Allegheny wood rat um, specifically. So it's a different a different outlook on art, um, perhaps one that visitors wouldn't even necessarily think about, um, but it was, it was great to include that uh, perspective. So then this one, we're looking at the red field, um, the snowy scene in, uh, uh, in, sorry, in Lumberville. I just wanna make sure actually now that I did that, that I'm on the right number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we'll give it a try. If it's his other quote, then, there, then so be it. And I just wanna say, he and I had a great time talking. He has a great sense of humor, even mm -hmm. though um, a lot of what he talks about is um, fairly upsetting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of environmental talk these days is upsetting. Right. So can you um, can you see Reg mid laugh there? Yeah. OK, great. Well, I, you know, part of that, and I think that with, with any viewing of, of any piece, your personal history is involved there. Uh, and so I'm originally from Maine. I grew up in Maine. And uh, I, I know that winters are not anything at all what they were when I was a child growing up uh, in my hometown. Um, and so whenever I see these beautiful winter scenes, and knowing what the projections are for climate change, uh, you know, we're gonna have a snow-free state in the not too distant future. So that kind of scene is not gonna be around anymore. Um, and we did it, we did it ourselves. So that is not what you generally think of when you go to the museum and you see a beautiful, uh, thank you, Jen, for this picture of the painting, Lumberville in Winter by Edward Redfield, something that we're very proud of in our area. Um, that's not what I think of, but of course, uh, it's a, you know, it's another perspective. Laura, Joshua? I think that that's a valid point. It's certainly, um... It's not just the winter scenes. There's also like the the shad and the Allegheny wood rat. I think it, it's interesting to hear from someone like Reg this new perspective or this additional perspective of environmentalism overlay. Like when he sees it, he sees his own work in it. So, um, in a way that you know, um, in a way that I don't experience art, for example. So this is a whole lens that when I look at these works, I you know I don't know enough about the specific species of tree being depicted here. Um, but when Reg looks at this artwork, he sees that um, and he understands how the landscape has changed over time and that it's really um, exciting to bring that kind of voice um, to this space as well. Why? So Reg, as I said, he is a um, humorous guy. Um, we had a lot of laughs, but every work he chose was... Um, you know, beautiful landscapes, and maybe we can take a look at some of those works. Uh, and he had a, um, a sad story to tell about each of them. I think, Jen, we might have um, the the image of the chestnut tree, which, of course, was, um, there we go, was an important and economic uh, part of, it was important to the economy of our region throughout the Appalachians and the invasive species that wiped it out. Uh, destroyed an economy and also destroyed a beautiful species. Is that really what we want to think about when we're looking at the <laughs> red field or the Pullinger? I mean, I, it's again, I, I don't know if it's necessarily about what what we what we want <laughs> our perspective to be. We're, what we're doing is we're just showing that there's 
there's different ways of looking at an artwork. There's different takeaways um, in, in as part of that process, and not you know not. I think I think you can. I think you can think about artwork both ways. You can appreciate its beauty, but then also recognize, you know, what might be what may be lost that's depicted as well. And just, I think that artists that were that made these scenes were also kind of were thinking about their environment too. Obviously, like if you go back to the Daniel Garber etching of of Harmonville, like this, he's very you know very deliberately depicting an industrial scene, which you can see in the background, and you have this like bare what looks like a split and dying uh, tree in the foreground and I mean I don't know I don't think we have anything you know written by Garber saying you know that, that he, he made this to criticize industry but it's hard to not read that into this work you know it's it, to me it does seem critical of of industry in this area um, and its effect on the landscape which clearly Garber loved and, and painted frequently, um, usually without any kind of industry. This is like a rare instance um, where he does capture that. So um, I think I think what Reg does, at least for me, is he is is recognizing or or alerting our attention to the fact that these these artworks are engaged with environmental change, whether they're intentionally so or not. So, uh, uh, sorry, Joshua, please go ahead. I would say Reg is also one of the characters that we work with who we didn't necessarily implement his full vision here where, but he, in terms of interpretive voice had wanted at some point to show like, uh, you know, a stuffed Allegheny wood rat or, you know, pieces of chestnut tree and things like that. And a, a totally new sort of this additional context building um, the way that a science museum display would be to talk about these things that are shown in, in the workers, sort of the things that he's talking about on his labels. And, and we didn't necessarily implement that because I think that that speaks to your question about um, also understanding what's the message here <laughs> um, and how do you not distract from the overall message, even though it, it, um, I think if we had put a giant piece of chestnut tree, it would be very distracting <laughs> to, to understanding the work or even the message as a whole. Um, but he was one that was, I think, willing to explore or probe these ideas a little bit further. I'm sorry, I cut you off. So that's actually an interesting idea. It makes me think of the barns and the way they have the sort of the metal objects in with um, their collection. And they have, uh, you know, a, sort of a bringing a different perspective to the objects, but in a different way, not from a sort of a perspective that's still from an aesthetic point of view. But I don't know, is that something you would consider in the future is maybe having some uh, like an environmental display or exhibition that would have some of those objects? Maybe. If it, it works. Yeah, it, yeah <laughs> exactly. If it, if yeah. If it, yeah, it depends on the what you know what we're what we're trying to do and if it um okay. if it's aligned with the themes of the of the exhibition. Yeah. So long but as just, it supports the educational mission of the yeah. right. Yeah, fair enough. That's yeah, enough. but and I so do, but I do want to, and I think Reg is thinking about this too, um, or at least I think you know probably that's why he agreed to do this kind of work is that is that art art can help spur change. I think and has been used to spur change, and you know the creation of national parks is really built on you know landscape painting and photography that captured these places that were showed before political bodies to have to generate support for you know preservation of landscapes. Um, so it's. I, and I, so I think what Reg is doing is kind of helping us see that, that, that artwork can help alert us to issues and problems and, and hopefully inspire us to, to make different choices and, and change our, um, you know, the way, the way we interact with the world going forward. I do have one clip from him about that. I think mm -hmm. where he does it as well. Um, and let's see if I can pull it up and if I've queued it properly. This is uh, playing video is new for us on Art Talk. So let's see if we can get that going. You know, I think that this, this again fits right in with, with my kind of message of One Health. And One Health is, is saying that we need to approach things in a transdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. So this was a fantastic opportunity for me to, to be able to go into a world that is a bit foreign to me and maybe for people who look at what I do as being quite foreign uh, and for us to kind of interact with each other. So I think that this really opens new doors, I believe. And I think it's a good thing for us to 
to hear different points of view. You know, we're becoming so polarized in our society that what we really need to do is to to listen to each other, to hear different points of view, think about things from a little bit different point of view, uh, and maybe maybe change your own point of view in the process. There you go. Is that what you see as the role of an art museum? Does that fit in with the mission? To me, to me it does. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I could have said it any better than that. Okay. <laughs> Joshua? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, voice so, and perception and, and asking yourself all sorts of interesting questions and seeing things that you couldn't see anywhere else is the joy of exploring a museum to me. That's actually why people go to see physical museums and, and not just look it up online. But it changes the role a little bit of the museum, right? I mean, we're used to going to the museum and in a way receiving. We go and we enjoy the pictures or whatever the objects are that that museum specializes in. We read the, um, I learned a new term, didactic materials that help us understand what we're looking at, the context and history and what the academic interpretation is. That's the experience we're used to having. And now um, you've brought in people who are not specialists directly in those areas and you're having them talk to us and maybe even letting us say something back. That is a change. It is a change, but I but I think it's happening across uh, institutions all over the country and the world too. So thinking about the museum and, and instead of like you know an ivory tower that disseminates and controls information, like why not why not think of the museum as a like almost like a community living room where people can come together um, and talk and learn and you know exchange ideas. I I think that's perhaps the more <laughs> exciting conception of the museum to me in a more um, inclusive and, uh, you know, and, and one that I, I think will hopefully, you know, attract more people than, you know, our, but the visitors we, you know, we typically receive. I think all of us here, you know, at least the panelists on the screen and probably many of the participants are like, you know, grow up going to museums, understand museums and, you know, expect a certain thing from them and feel comfortable in museums. But, you know, there's people out there that don't feel comfortable in museums that feel like it's not for them. And I think um, a lot of museums and the missioner included are thinking more about how to reach those audiences and make, make our experience more accessible and approachable to, a, you know, a wider swath of, of visitors from different backgrounds. Yeah. I think there's also a part of it where the truth of the matter is that environmental historians have also been visitors of museums since museums have been around, right? But we've been privileging one very specific mm -hmm. profession's voice in the interpretation on museum walls. And so instead, what we're doing here is we're inviting those other experiences um, or those other ways of seeing art um, to be explored or probed for the visitor. So that's, you know, um, I think that that's where it kind of comes in, you know, the members of the Delaware tribe have for a very long time been going to museums, but in this case, we're inviting them to talk about that um, and to ask other visitors to think about their experience when they visit museums as well. Right. Yeah. So let, let's take a look. You, um, we have a, some more um, voices to hear from. You mentioned the Delaware tribe. Um, you had Joe Baker come in. Tell us a little bit about him and um, uh, why you chose him to participate in Reframe. So Joe um, is, a, in this, is an artist and a historian um, and just um, also a curator as well. Um, and he uh, is, I've, I said earlier, an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Oklahoma. And he's also the co-founder and now executive director of the Lenape Center in New York. And the Lenape Center has done a lot of work recently with institutions um, in Lenape Hoking, the, the land, you know, traditional land of the Lenape people um, to, to both, um, you know, think differently about their collections and also um, craft land acknowledgements. Um, and so we were interested in working with the Lenape Center as a whole, just to, you know, think about our own institution and, you know, how we can think about the Lenape and indigenous history and art within our own walls, which we, I, I don't, the Michener has not really um, devoted a lot of attention to in the, in the past. Um, and um, 
Joe has also done some work with the Metropolitan Museum of Art too, um, writing labels for some works in their collection as well. So he was kind of very familiar with this um, process. So we were excited that he was interested in working with us as well. Wow. That, <laughs> Excuse great. me, I, I, have a, I have a cold, so my, my voice is sort of starting to cut out a little bit. <laughs> We appreciate both. I know you're both not at 100%. <laughs> so we appreciate your time here tonight. Okay, let's hear from Joe. He described a little bit about the process and the work he chose. And quickly get past this little still. Well, I was uh, given a variety of choices in terms of artwork that I could select. I can't hear him. I don't know if did the sound cut out for everyone. Yeah. Sorry, um, let me back it up a little bit. Uh, My apologies. Drawing on paper. This is the experimental. Let me just check my cue. Thanks for letting me know. Here we go. Well, I was uh, given a variety of choices in terms of artwork that I could select to respond to. And uh, I gave a considerable amount of time and thought uh, to each of those um, examples. And I settled upon a, a very um, beautiful piece by the artist Diane Burko entitled Dev Delaware River Number no. 2. Um, it's a colored uh, pencil drawing on paper, uh, 1982, and it's quite large in format, but it it is the it gives the view of the Delaware River, um, and I thought that the one uh, question where we could begin to um, understand that this river which was depicted in this landscape, it really holds a much more um, um, hostile and uh, bloody history, a history of genocide that's really just below the surface of the pastels and the marks on paper. And to me, that is a metaphor for how this country has erased the truth of our founding, the erasure of the Lenape people and presence within the homeland. Starting in 1609 with the arrival of the Dutch, followed then by the British, and then finally the United States government. When we began our work in 2009 within Manhattan, you could, you rarely heard, rarely anyone mention Lenape. Uh, and it was true that at the university, among anthropologists and archaeologists, people were discussing Lenape as people of the past. But for the public, there was little to zero sense of the indigenous people who lived here. So I think that's true, particularly within the Northeast. And it's something that we need, and I believe it's a story yet to be told. And it's a story we all can benefit uh, from the telling. If we can just open our minds to the fact that this is part of our history, it's part of the founding of this country, um, and it's something that our youth today, the young people, are wanting to know. They're no longer content and satisfied with the old story of the vanish, the vanquished people, the people, the people are gone. Uh, they're where, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where are they today? Who are these people? What happened? We want to know. 
And, and I think that they're going to hold us accountable. And I think we're in a beautiful uh, period in, in that respect. Um, and I think good things can come of it. Reaction? Laura, you're, <laughs> Laura, you're muted. Just in case I know you're... I'm muted. I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to follow that, <laughs> honestly. But I mean, that's I, mean, that's I think that's one of the reasons why we really wanted Joe's perspective um, to be included, because I think it's it's a really important and significant one. Um, and and one that I, I don't like I said, I don't think um, has been included in the Michener really much at all. Um, so I think it's an important kind of step forward. And we're, we're hoping to work with Joe. We're planning to work with Joe on a future curatorial project to again thinking about the Lenape presence in this region um, in the past and present and future. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, Jen, do we have the Laura Burke? There we go. Jen has always got it. Yeah. Got it. Which is really, it's nine feet long. It's, it's a very impressive work. And I know Diane Burke's work is probably familiar to many of our viewers right now too. And this is an early work of hers. Um, and when Joe, you know, wrote his label, which, you know, as he talked about, was about, you know, thinking about this work and what's not, what's not depicted, which is, um, you know, the, the presence of the Lenape on the shores and also their, you know, their genocide and removal from the region um, by, by white settlers. And we had shared, prior to the exhibition opening, we shared his label text with Diane um, as well, just to make sure that, you know, she was aware and, um, she was very open and receptive, of, of course, to his um, interpretation and explained like, you know, I was not aware of these things when I made this work, um, you know, up 1982, which is it's almost 40, 40 years ago. Yeah. And um, she's like, but now I consider myself more of an activist. And a lot of Diane's work now, of course, is um, involved, with, especially with um, engaged with climate change and environmental concerns very explicitly, like she considers herself an activist and, and an artist, where at this point in time, when this work was created, she can thought of herself as a landscape painter. Um, so I've actually, it's been interesting to, I've, I've really enjoyed kind of thinking about Diane's work and um, Joe Baker's interpretation together. And actually we're planning on a program at the Michener in the future, having the two of them in conversation, which I think will be really um, uh, exciting and rewarding. So um, stay tuned. and and uh, pay attention to our website as more details come out. I mean, it's certainly not what I would have thought of when I was looking at this work uh, by Diane Burko. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is definitely a new perspective for me and has me thinking in different ways as I look at that. Joshua, do you have something to add? Well, so I think one point or even your intro, Laura, you mentioned that this is a little bit on museum practice and sort of what's going on right now. And I think one thing that is very much in the zeitgeist, the cultural zeitgeist in the museum profession is acknowledging the role that museums have played in sort of the making of historic erasure um, and perpetuating certain stories over others or privilege privileging certain histories over others. And uh, I think that this is like in, in Joe as a curator calls us out as well in, in the label a little bit and says, you know, this is step one of a many step process that I hope to continue, um, where the museum is participating in using our platform to help unmake that history and to, to help share uh, the Delaware and the Lenape story. All right, very good. We do I want to share, if it's okay, I want to share actually something that Joshua said um, when we were talking about this just a, a couple of weeks ago, but um, talking about, you know, like it's not, um, you know, like why why should we think about the Lenape with this work when clearly the artist wasn't, you know, that's not the artist's goal. That's not what they, you know, what Diane wanted to do or represent. She's just, you know, it's just a beautiful view of the Delaware River. And Joshua said, which I thought was really lovely, like the, the Baker, Joe Baker experiences the absence in this work. And I think that's important to acknowledge that some people we might look at this, you know, as a, as a white woman and just see, for example, I, I will just, you know, like what, that's what a lovely view of the Delaware River, but like Joe Baker has a, you know, a very different perspective on work like this. Um, and I think that's important to share. So the museum in this case is actually um, promoting a conversation that it goes beyond, you know, the usual perspective and has 
I mean, you know, as I said to one of your curators, I'm now, you know, in that case, literally having a conversation with them, but all of your visitors are also having a conversation with these curators in a way that's much more conscious than we thought about in the past, perhaps when the museum yeah. was anonymous, when the curators were in a way anonymous. Right. Because I mean, we included we include bios of all of our guest curators in the in the exhibition. There's there's photos of them. Um, you can see a little bit of that to the left of this work here. Um, if that's you know this information about Joe Baker and his in his intro and and we also make sure that you know that that they're credited for it's their words that are in the show, uh, which we aren't usually so explicit about, like who writes the label, for example. And usually it's not we don't have like a byline or anything on those those texts, but in this case, we we do. Um, but that's because we wanted to make sure that um, our curators could share personal reflections, um, as, which comes especially comes through in the Rainbow Rooms um, selections. Um, yeah, we wanted to make sure that they were they were credited for their for their perspectives. So but let's take a couple of questions that we have in the chat or in the Q&A. And if anybody else has more then join us. Jen? Sure, we have Jim Feld said, I love the idea of a museum becoming a community room, like Phillips Mill Community Association. <laughs> uh, and he wanted to know, Laura and Joshua, what do you think about the Van Gogh and Monet 3D art shows traveling oh. around? So I, I haven't seen them. You haven't either, Joshua, right? No. I've only ever I, seen recordings of them, but yeah. Yeah, it's... um how to say this. I think it's great that they're getting people excited about art and, and learning about Van Gogh and Monet. And I think there's, there's, there's others too. I think um, like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling was traveling and like big reproductions and things like that. Um, I mean, I think all of that is great. Like the more, I don't know, art can kind of get out in the world and inspire people. Um, I think it's wonderful. It's, it's not my <laughs> personal cup of tea, but that's, that's just, that's just me again you know we talked at the beginning like we're part of a, a privileged museum loving <laughs> group of people here and I um I like to see the actual work um versus the you know the kind of more um per, I don't know performative part of it but um that's just me personally I but I'm all for it if others that's what others how others want to experience our work yeah there's definitely a part of it that I'm really excited for. So as like a designer, there's a part of it that I'm really excited for, which is that it brings certain things that may not be accessible to certain audiences out where they can experience them in new ways. Um, and actually the technology used in those shows is some of what's being used right now to bring like the Lasco Caves reproductions to people because mm -hmm. you can no longer access that for conservation reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So you're able to bring something that is otherwise completely inaccessible to the public to the public domain um, using those same types of tactics and experiences. So I think that there's, um, I think to Laura's point, if it's encouraging people to experience things that they couldn't in other ways, I think that that's awesome. Um, as long as the interpretation doesn't become too much about spectacle, right? And this isn't like making Hogwarts, <laughs> um, which is also the Reichman Institute right now, like the, the Harry Potter show. Like <laughs> I don't want people to conflate um, an authentic artwork with a sort of make-believe world. <laughs> mm. Right. Well, in our area, you know, you referenced it earlier, Laura, we're famous for the Pennsylvania Impressionist, the New Hope School that, you know, is obviously very close to our heart here in Bucks County and at the Phillips Mill, the Michener. Um, and I, I thought it was so interesting that you brought in T.K. Smith, who is a cultural historian um, to talk about and who's interested in landscapes generally. Um, I think before we take a look at what he is with the artwork that um, one of the artworks that he chose, Jen, if you, I think you have this, if you could play his thoughts about landscape and, um, you know, which is a, a little bit different than a lot of us who are, you know, admiring the beauty of the, you know, the red field before the Garber, the Lathrops and Coppages. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what he has to say about landscape. He's also, he's also here in the in the uh, audience. So <laughs> hi, TK. <welcome> TK. <laughs> yeah. Very good to have him here. We had a great conversation. That was a privilege for me. And here he is talking. Again, my research is about the, the environments that shape our bodies and vice versa. Um, and kind of being transformative about that in landscapes in the American context have most as a genre of of 
printmaking, painting. Um, it's also a form of identity making. You know, in the early reaches of this nation, landscapes were used as promotional material to get people to come here. You know, they were saying, this is what's happening in the West. Look at this vast, beautiful, bountiful, pure, you know, virginal land. You know, look at this, this expanse of opportunity and freedom. Uh, look at how beautiful and bountiful it was. Early environmentalists, you know, uh, environmental historians, a lot of them track some of those early American paintings because they were attempting to protect the wilderness. And that was that romantic belief that humans had strayed too far in the Industrial Revolution. And so they were using these beautiful, surreal, vivid, sublime landscapes to try to convince people not to, you know, come and destroy the U.S.'s pure untouched land they teach race you know there's a lot of hidden indigenous people in a lot of early american landscapes um, of who knows what tribe of who knows what traditional dress more so imagined than anything else so already in these early american landscapes we're seeing race being imagined and created you know in in various ways as well as like confronting with technology these landscapes went from pure and untouched to the 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 traversing train to steamship to urban landscapes, you know, and, and so they're just this very interesting way of looking at America, the US, um, or the Americas, and how we collectively have shaped an identity through the visual and the material. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I was muted. <laughs> it's okay. I, I mean, that's, I think that's a, you know, it's a great and very important perspective. Lands, landscape, you know, they have, they, they had a purpose and an agenda and um, were evolved, very much involved in building a sense of national identity in the United States. However, it was a national identity for really only a, so, you know, a certain group of people, not for all people. Um, and I think TK really, you know, described that very well it's they're they're not they're not passive pictures they're 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 more engaged with political economic and environmental concerns than i think um art historians in the past have given them credit for i think now that's that's become more widely recognized but it's 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 important to tease that out joshua between TK and Laura, I don't think there's much that I could add to that. It's correct. <laughs> yes. All right. And TK, if you're there, um, we're happy to hear from you live as well. We appreciate you joining us. Um, you know, I, is there this process, how is it um, changing your perspectives? I mean, you're presenting through inviting new voices in. Uh, something that certainly I wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Is it affecting you as museum professionals? I, I think it's changing the way um, that I look at and write about our collection too. I think I'm much more aware of my own, um, you know, background and um, privilege, frankly, when I, when I write labels and I, I frequently kind of check you know, the language that I'm using, I don't assume a shared experience across all of our visitors. I, I don't assume the shared language. You know, we, we talk about, for example, styles and trends in art history that, you know, some people just might not be, you know, he, there's people that don't know what impressionism means, you know, for example. And so it's like, you know, making sure that we're, you know, we're unpacking terms, we're un, you know, unpacking those ideas within our text as well. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would love to continue this moving forward too, to invite in um, different perspectives on our artwork. You know, to, I, I see that frequently at museums where you have, you know, the, tr the traditional label, right? But then you might have, uh, you know, a, vis a visitor, a community member, another scholar, right? An additional label that provides a different layer of context. I was at um, a museum recently that, um, it kind of it was especially thinking about the pandemic and art and how art can be seen as something almost healing and therapeutic for for visitors you know coming out of 
even though we're still in it, of course, but like, you know, that we're experiencing isolation during the, during the early days, especially of the coronavirus. And so they, they, they had these, these kind of labels throughout the galleries of, of visitors writing about their own personal reflections on different artwork, um, almost like a form, like a form of therapy in a way. And I, I thought that was really kind of lovely and, and moving and um, might, might be appealing to people who just, you know, want, just want to experience art for, you know, its own um, kind of like, you know, for their own, through their own personal reactions to it and would be interested what someone else saw or thought that's not a scholar. Um, yeah. <laughs> So Joshua, is it a challenge to in to design the exhibit with um, all of these different voices? Uh, yes, <laughs> um, I think that was something that we definitely struggled with: was how do you make an exhibition of so 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 much variety in its first place um, feel cohesive and also mm -hmm. have the visitor understand what it is that they're looking at? So there's a hierarchy of information that we have to provide where people understand which curator is speaking in, in which section. Um, there's also uh, the idea, you know, and, and to the point of process is like some of the things that the Rainbow Room youth curators were sort of proposing challenged my, my core of like, what is interpretive content? Where one of the curators there was like, I made a personal painting as a response to this. And that's what mm -hmm. I want to be my label. And I was like, you know, and it, it probed these ideas like, do we have to provide metadata, you know, about artwork? You know, should we? You know, if, is it enough to just say the curator just wants to put this other painting up as their interpretation of this work? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or do we have to provide, you know, title, artist, you know, in that challenged the core of what I think of as a designer, what I've been taught to think of as like our baseline, what we do. Um, so that that was also challenging was like, okay, how far can we go? I mentioned Reg Hoyt was like excited about certain elements that I was like, I think that might be too much um, or it might be distracting. So we we had to find the right balance um, of keeping things on message and then also making it feel cohesive because we also have these other elements sprinkled in the museum and, and making sure that the visitor understands what's kind of happening. Yeah, we also had varying lengths of text too. So some, some curators wrote very short text and some curators wrote very long text and so it was also you know how do we there's there's one there's one label by one of our rainbow room curators where we included the, a longer version in the booklet that there's a, also a booklet that you can pick up in the exhibition too um, but then a shorter version on the walls as well um, so it's yeah it's 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 very wide-ranging responses not just in terms of you know the actual content but also the way that it was um it was kind of presented to us or given to us, submitted to us. Um, and we didn't, we didn't want to insert ourselves too much in that kind of editing stage. I mean, we did copy editing and maybe made some suggestions, but that we, we really wanted um, their voice to not be um, imposed upon. So, I mean, there's challenges all over. There's challenges to the content. There's the logistical challenge of the tradition and the, um, con the you know, the, the exhibit design. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are opportunities too. And yeah. um, obviously <laughs> that's why we're doing it. You're doing it. And that's why we're talking about it. Um, I want to go back to T.K. Smith because he had a take on um, the Harry Leith Ross um, artwork that I had no idea what to do with and found very interesting. So it was a rewarding experience for me. And it's, uh, you know, it's a subject matter that apparently Harry Leith Ross um, spent a lot of time with. Do you want to prep that before we go to what TK has to say or? <laughs> I feel like, cause I don't, I haven't seen the clip that you're going to show. So I'm kind of like, I don't know if I want to say anything before. The, I mean, okay. I know what he wrote, but I'm curious to hear what he Go to TK first. <laughs> yeah. were driving down this coast and they ended up in a predominantly black rural area and he saw this house that was on its last leg and he asked his wife could they stop so he could sketch it and as he was sketching a storm was coming and you know of course i'm connecting a storm and you can read this in the the text um to the oxbow you know coal and this the the storm as symbolism of progress or regression um, civilization, anti-civilization, that kind of symbolism that's kind of ingrained in early American 
um, landscapes. And so I'm thinking the rain must be imagined. He must have saw the black woman and it's the opposite. He was standing outside of this, you know, falling down, falling down structure and the rain was coming upon them and he sketched it, you know, and they got in their car and drove away. And this sketch became multiple paintings, oil paintings, uh, pen and ink drawings, prints. Um, it becomes all of these different things with only slight moderate modifications. You know, all the three pieces that are included in my section aren't the exact same. And he had imagined the black woman with the wagon. And that to me is very interesting. And also could, has the potential to be very beautiful. You know, maybe he was doing justice to that structure by putting someone who actually might live there um, in the painting, you know, or maybe, you know, he, he, saw a woman that he thought was beautiful earlier that day and thought, well, she must belong in this painting. She's a part of the story of this, this day trip I took with my wife. Um, so many things. It could be a childhood, you never know. But that curiosity, I think, is really interesting. I think, I think this, this, this Leith Ross painting, which um, the, the oil on canvas has been on display at the Michener um, for, for some time in our kind of main Pennsylvania Impressionist gallery. And it's always been intriguing to me as well, because I, I feel it's, it's like telling a story that we'll never really know what it is. Like it's, there's, a, there's a lot of ambiguity around it I, to me, um, narrative ambiguity. But it's almost like setting up. It's like the setup of of a story to me, and I and I, I love that you know TK and he he came and did some research in our archives too, and and you know learned about you know this trip that he took, Lee Ross took with his wife, and the sketches that he made, and I think that that helps a bit. But it's still I think, and I think um, TK captures this well. There there is this there is this ambiguity to this work, and and you know we it's like a mystery. I mean, and it is a very of course mysterious setting. <laughs> I mean that kind of helps, of course, but um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a fascinating work and one I've just always had sort of questions about that have have never really been answered. And um, but it it was it was um, wonderful to see TK dive into it. Joshua, this one was an interesting display challenge for me, <laughs> um, and, and um, partly because. <laughs> Um, if you tried to display them in series, like lengthwise, as you went down the wall, um, I don't think that you could actually make these direct comparisons because the, the works themselves are large enough and the interpretation that goes along with them. Um, you couldn't actually step back far enough to actually appreciate the differences. So we had to kind of display them as a tableau um, and a little bit of salon style going on. Um, and so I think you know, that was interesting to be able to use or, or combine the sort of gang label text to help the visitor actually see those differences that TK and Laura are sort of talking about as, as the story kind of evolves um, from the sketch through to the oil painting. Yeah. And I, and I also love, of course, um, TK looking back to 19th century landscape tradition and how it might that might have informed this work, too. And he, he references Thomas Cole's The Oxbow, which we did. Um, reproduce in the label text, which is, you know, just like a very iconic 19th century landscape painting that shows a, a storm approaching over um, over a river. And you can sort of see it's also been read as an allegory of like the development of the landscape, too, because you can see the landscape like, you know, it's there's fields and sort of like cultivation that you can see. And Cole himself was very vocal in terms of being anti-industry anti and concerned about the United States and industrialization and the impact on its society. Um, and, you know, it was Leith Ross picking up on all of that and that's sort of like directly referencing Oxbow. Like we, I don't know, we'll probably never know, but I think, I, I think as an, as an artist that was trained and, you know, understood, um, you know, knew, had a knowledge of art history, like he must have known that painting or been familiar with it. And, you know, maybe in his subconscious, like it's back there, you know, and I think you can, you know, you can see in the um, Conte crown on paper, the, the sort of dramatic um, sheets of rain aren't incorporated yet. And so he like very purposely adds them later. And then the file, final oil painting, it's much more horizontal, you know, to almost just show these like billowing rain, rain clouds that are passing by. So it heightens that element of, of, um, of almost danger. Although um, TK also writes about how 
just figures and it's almost like a liminal space between between the, the, the approaching storm and also like the clearing of the storm to going forward. I feel weird to me because he's here that I feel like <laughs> and I, I know he's not on the panel. I'm so not TK, sure. I hope I'm not getting like all of this wrong, but I, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not, not sure I'm not doing you a of justice. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. You might not want to be added to the family. <laughs> true, that's true. <laughs> uh, well, don't, we don't do. I do in. want to say that we are having conversations about how we can use the interviews that I did with each of the three curators that we've already talked with, with that we've shown tonight, and because very interesting perspectives. Um, and I, I, I definitely want to end with the um, another quote, another clip from Joe Baker. But before we do, I think we have to talk about. Um, that there is a challenge here, that there are people who have, there's demographics who have run these spaces and, um, and who've occupied these spaces. And, you know, is this a threat? Is this a challenge um, to that, you know, for lack of a better word, hegemony? I mean, it's kind of like you, um... When we were talking about design challenges earlier, Laura, and you flipped it to be an opportunity. <laughs> I might, I might do that as well. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, a, I think it's like an opportunity to think more expansively about our collection and its interpretation, um, and that might be challenging to some people. Um, kind of like you know, it's it's not it's not easy work even on our end. Um, but I, but I think you know, hard hard good work is is challenging and. Um, I, I personally want to be challenged in the way that I look at things and understand art. I, I don't. I don't want to be in my comfort in a comfort zone, you know, in perpetuity. I, I want challenge, and um, I hope others are open to that too. Well, I think that's that, how you grow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember who said the quote, but the idea that knowledge is lighting a fire, not filling a bucket. Um, I don't think that there. Th this. The idea of interpretation is not finite. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that um, we have an opportunity here to include many more voices. And in doing so, it's a much more fair and equitable process. But um, that sharing doesn't come necessarily at the expense of other voices, because um, they're still participating. They're still present. Um, but now we're being much more inclusive, and we're bringing those marginalized voices into museum space uh, and sharing it with others. And I, I think that it's truly a sharing exercise. Um, it doesn't doesn't cost anyone much to do that. Well, and I think it comes down to what do you think art is 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 art a challenge or is art a decoration? And I, you know, there there's no answer to that except for the individual. But that is a little bit underlying this conversation. Um, all right, I I'm going to go back to Joe Baker. I'm going to try this technology one more time. Uh, give me one second on the on the point. Here we go. And I have to back up. And I hope I got the right point here. Work collectively and to work responsibly and to work in kinship and in community to really begin to make a difference um, in a world that is so threatened and so fragile today with uh, a climate crisis, with polarization, with um, the divisions that exist within um, our communities, the racism, um, we really are in a critical position. And I believe the indigenous voice can contribute greatly to a renewed um, future. But in order for that to occur, institutions and organizations, our museums, our universities, our colleges, uh, our governments really need to invite indigenous people to the table. They can't be kept at a distance 
or kept in some performative uh, manner. They have to be at the table contributing to the discussion. All right. So I think Joe is speaking for the Lenape, but I think it translates to the different voices, inviting different voices in to the conversation in our different institutions, including museums, which I think so far have been a little bit immune to uh, that opening. They're, they're definitely, I mean, museums are definitely more engaged with it now. Um, and I think you, you see that, you know, in the news and you probably, you know, and many of your the viewers here and the recent museum visits, they, they, they're seeing changes, I think, across how museums are presenting material and what kind of material museums are presenting. Um, I think we're all very aware that that is long past due for these kinds of changes um moving forward and it's it's important work joshua and on and ongoing work as or it should be ongoing work as joe says I, and I, I and i forgot to mention in the beginning also part of reframe is we were thinking you know how thinking about doing this project so it can help inform you know future gallery reinstallation um so it is we're, we're hoping to learn from this process um and and you know hope for, continue these partnerships going forward we're just going to wrap it up. Joshua, last thought. Um, I think that this has been a, a slow and long occurring process, I think, is I think several museums across the country, especially with like the Native Americans Graves Protections and Repatriations Act in the early 1990s, were forced to confront this issue. Um, and many museums who didn't experience it, where they had were, were forced to invite people to the table, have kind of slept in isolation for a bit. But I do think that the field as a whole has moved in this direction. I'm encouraged in particular to see not just curatorial voice, but also in terms of design and layout, like how are we inviting um, other perspectives on the way that we present material um, and, and think about experience and path and flow and, and how people are engaging the material on a design level. It's not, it's not just voice. Um, and I think that's also the future. You know, it's an exciting space to be in right now. That is exciting. Well, I appreciate both of you coming and talking with us about Reframe, uh, the community perspectives on the Michener's Connect collection, uh, Laura Igo and Joshua Lassard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you also to Joe Baker, to Reg Hoyt, TK Smith. Thank you to our executive producer, Jen McHugh, uh, to our content producers, Dennis Riley and Jean Hitch. Uh, join us next month for Art Talk. And for now, we'll say goodnight. I'm Laura Womack. Thank you all for joining us and spending your evening with us. Bye.